be here. So like I said, I'm Lindsay Heiss. I'm an instructor at Alamance Community College. I teach landscape design and other horticulture classes. Um, my background, my undergraduate degree was from NC State uh, from, the, from the horticulture <laughs> department uh, with a concentration in landscape design. And then I got a graduate certificate from George Washington University in landscape design and then a master's from Virginia Tech in landscape architecture. And after all that, I've been practicing um, landscape design for many years. Um, I just started teaching just two years ago. So um, in this presentation, you may see a few, a few things that I've designed, some, some things that went wrong. <laughs> um, so that's how, that's how we learn. Um, and then there are just some images uh, that I've just pulled off the internet that were just good, good examples. So today we're going to be talking about residential landscape design. Okay? And where I'd like to start is with the fact that form follows function. Now, a lot of times when I, when I start teaching landscape design, I, I start with the design principles and the design elements. But today we're going to end on those because what I've noticed in residential landscape design or oftentimes when I go to a client's home, the thing that's missing is just basic function. Um, our pathways, where they need to be, uh, things like that. So if you do not have function, then everything starts to fall apart. So at first, it must be functional. And so as this states, a, a landscape should not just be a pretty picture for people to view. The landscape should support the activities of the residents. That's very important. So um, when it comes to function, we're talking about organizing space, essentially. Um, when we don't have that organization, that's when, like I said, it all falls apart. Uh, things become inconvenient. Maybe where your trash can is. Uh, not uh, in a very con convenient place. Uh, things are less functional, uh, or spaces are less functional, and potentially it's not going to be as attractive. So, and that's important, right? Because ultimately we want a beautiful garden, a uh, beautiful landscape. So um, the, this image here is just showing a site analysis. And one way that you can, can start organizing your, your landscape or a landscape um, is, is to sketch it out and do a site analysis. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what a site analysis is. The other image over here, this is actually, um, if anyone's familiar with permaculture principles and practices, um, one of the ways that in permaculture uh, that space is, is organized um, or sites are organized are by zones and basically just in a nutshell because uh, we're not that's a whole other topic in itself um, uh, the things that you need to, to pay close attention to need to be closer to the home and then as you move further away so when it comes to plants for instance you know, your vegetable garden or your herbs and things like your kitchen garden should be closer to the kitchen, should be closer to the house. Uh, when it comes to an orchard or something like that, it's going to be further away. Um, so, so basically just really thinking about the whole site and, and organizing it. So um, essentially, if we were just to break down a, a basic residential site, there's three uh, main areas. Your more public uh, space, which is typically the front, uh, your private, and then your utility areas. Bless you. So with your public areas, that's going to be of uh, what the public sees. So typically the front yard, like I said. <laughs> now, if you have a corner lot, that's different, right? Because it's not just your front yard, it would also be a side yard that would be considered your public space. So that changes the design, okay? And, and where you're gonna place things or, or how you're going to address them. Um, as far as, uh, uh, this is just kind of a typical, often um, it's giving a, a high design priority just because people want uh, curb appeal. Although I have seen that there has been a shift, um, people are 
really wanting their backyards and their private areas to be their oasis, mm -hmm. and they are putting more into that um, versus just you know uh, keeping up appearances. Uh, so they're investing a lot more in their private spaces. Um, but typically, people with like uh, uh, you know in a residential landscape want the front or the public space to be nice and appealing. Um, <clears throat> Also, uh, it, it needs to be simple and uh, complement the architecture. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, and then it also is going to in include these functional pieces like parking, your driveways, your walkways, um, so your, your circulation. When it comes to your private outdoor living areas, um, like I said, it's typically your, your backyard, and um, that's where you're going to have decks and patios and your uh, pools or spas, gazebos, natural areas, playgrounds, vegetable gardens. There's a lot going on in the backyard, potentially, right? Um, outdoor kitchens, those are very popular. Uh, so that, there's a lot to consider there. And then as far as you, your utility areas, um, that is, is something that cannot be overlooked. And um, I, I can't put enough emphasis on this. So when it comes to utilitarian things, like having trash cans, everyone has. So often I have arrived on a, a potential client site and their trash can is basically a focal point. We're gonna talk about focal points in a little while, but basically it's front and center as if it's supposed to be a piece of sculpture or something, but it is not. It is a trash can. So, you know, knowing, okay, I, I mean, I've got a trash can, I need to get to it. It needs to be functional and in a convenient place. You know, you don't want it back on the back 40. It does need to be closer to, to where you're taking the trash out, but let's think about it. How can we conceal it and, and um, you know, have it more discreet? Like, here's a nice example. Um, where the front of the house or the drive is it up over here. Um, but it's just around the corner, probably from the garage. So very convenient. Um, sheds, um, so sheds, boats, I mean, they're, the, the list goes on. Dog lots, compost piles, clotheslines, greenhouses, power lines. These are all things that must be considered. And when they are not, it becomes problematic. Um, so we also want to think about um, the function, but then also form. I'm going to talk on that a little bit. So this, this picture, these two pictures are actually, um, I, I designed a, a fire pit area for um, my, my parents. This is their backyard. And off to the side over here, um, I designed this uh, firewood holder slash counter, whatever you want to call it, um, over here. Because if you look in the back, okay, there's some more wood piles. Well, there's more over here with tarps and whatnot. And so my dad and I sometimes, we don't necessarily butt heads. That would be a wrong thing to say. <laughs> but he's all about function and function only. <laughs> um, and so, so I'm constantly trying to be like, okay, dad, so we need, we need, a, we need to have the fire, the, the wood closer to us, but is there a better way we can, we can have that without having tarps all over the place and plywood sitting on top of wood. I'm working on it. It's a hard, hard, uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, but, but, but anyway, because ultimately, you know, in this class, we're talking about function, but form is important too. That's the only way that we're going to have, we're going to get the aesthetic, we're going to get beauty in our landscape. Okay, so like I mentioned before, analysis of the landscape. This is just a, a kind of a typical, simple analysis where you've got the drawing, the footprint of the home, and there are lots of notes jotted down, such as you know where there's high points and where the water's flowing, where there's existing plant material, uh, where there might be a need for screening. There's all of these things to consider. When it comes to design, when you do a landscape design, at the end, when you have a completed project, you will have made thousands of decisions. Thousands of decisions. And they all need to be uh, uh, 
they, they all need to have um, reasoning. And, and you can do that when you start with an analysis and then you build from there as to, so things really shouldn't be arbitrary in a landscape. They should actually be thought out and <laughs> I hear giggles. <laughs> so, um, but that's what I teach in my landscape de design classes, that there's really a reason for, for everything. Um, so, <clears throat> with the analysis, one of the things that you're gonna you're gonna be looking at are things that you need to consider. That's very important is circulation. Okay, so circulation means how do you move around the site? It, circulation could also include vehicles. You know, a driveway, how a vehicle comes through a site or into a site, and then how the people move through the site. Um, with this, this is an example, this is a very simple um, solution um, th that I gave to the, these particular clients. They had, I don't know, this is kind of dark for some reason, but um, so this is the, the landscape that was provided to them when they purchased the home, okay? And they had two young children who loved to play with the neighbors, okay? Their walkway um, is really tight you come down the steps and it just is very utilitarian and just went straight over to the driveway which is is a you know a decent path however the children who wanted to come across the street to go visit their friends did not pay attention to that sidewalk and they kept running through the shrubs and driving the parents crazy so I went with that and we just added some stepping stones. It's just a, it was a straight shot. It's kind of hard to see on this angle, but the stones are actually perfectly straight to um, the door there. So they can just zoom out the door. Um, and, you know, and, and it looks nice, right? We also added a wall and just kind of tidied things up, made it a little bit more interesting. Um, but circulation is very important. When, when it comes to um, landings of decks, or any place where you are frequently exiting um, off of a deck or off of a, a patio, um, you may see that the grass wears. In that case, you may need a landing, okay? Um, that is where, because that circulation is concentrated when you're coming off of, of a deck. So having grass come up to that, if you are frequently going off the deck, you need to have some kind of landing. Um, <coughs> It doesn't have to be big because from once you step off, from that point, you may be going in all kinds of different directions, all right? So that's something, something to think about. The other thing is um, when it comes to pathways, there are primary pathways, secondary pathways, and potentially tertiary pathways. Primary would be the ones that you, you, you travel most often. Typically, they are going to be the, um, the, the, the front walk. Um, and with your primary walkways, they're going to be wider. Okay? I would never make a primary walkway any less than three feet wide. Four is much better, uh, but no less than three. When it comes to a secondary pathway, it's okay to, to go from maybe, maybe two feet wide is enough. Because if you think about it, um, if someone's coming to your home, it, it may be more than one person, and, and you need to be able to potentially either walk side by side or at least comfortably two people walking down the sidewalk. Three feet is actually too narrow for that. Four, five feet is more comfortable for that. But if this is a, path, a secondary path, maybe one that you're traveling on your own, a side yard or maybe something in the backyard. So if you went down to two feet or so, that's, that's okay. Um, but you definitely want to, to think about um, the hierarchy of, of your pathways. Um, and if a path is a tertiary pathway, um, you, may, you may not, this may sound strange, but you may not need a pathway at all. Um, by that, I mean, let me go back actually to, okay, so, so here, you can't really see very well, but there's a landing here off the deck, and then there's this path into this area. But, we cut across the grass, and there's no need. It's a tertiary pathway. We don't, the, my family doesn't go out to the fire pit every day. So, you know, it's just certain times of the year, and there's no need to actually have a, a 
formal pathway of any sort. Um, okay, so your materials also may change with that. That's something to consider. A primary pathway needs to be typically more substantial. It may be concrete, it may be pavers. Um, you don't want to have tripping hazards. With your secondary pathways that you're not traveling as often, you may go a little bit more informal. It could be stone, it could be pea gravel. Um, you know, your materials start to change. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Utilities. All right, back to utilities. They cannot be ignored, yet they are all the time. Um, number one, uh, before, well, se okay, septic tank, septic fields. That's important to know where those are in a residential setting if you, if you have um, have those because that's going to impact what you can plant, right? Um, the, what I would actually put as number one, if I was to rank them, I would put the overhead lines or the power lines and the telephone lines because so often they are ignored. Um, look up <laughs> and make sure you account for, for that. Also, um, any overhangs, eaves, you know, off, off the house, uh, you definitely want to pay attention to that. Um, other utilities, air conditioning units, gas meters, cable boxes, your well. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to touch on some, something that we're going to touch on again. When it comes to knowing where these things are, one, it's access, right? You want to make sure you maintain access. Uh, with an AC unit, you also need airflow, okay? So you don't want to have dense plantings right up on. That's not good. So you need, those are things that you've got to consider. Um, but you also have to consider them as objects in the landscape that you're either going to disguise or try to ignore. And by that, I mean, let's take the example of the well in the front yard. So many times I've, I see in the front yard someone trying to cover up the well by planting uh, <laughs> some shrubs in a circle around the well or putting something on the well. Well now, all I want to do is look at the well. So, because what they're doing is they're highlighting, here it is, and they're not actually covering up. The only way to actually disguise it is to incorporate it into a very large bed, and then it may start to disappear with plantings. It would kind of, you know, it would, it would disappear. Um, the other way to, to handle that is to do nothing. To do nothing at all, to not plant around it, to just let it be, and you can provide focal points, which we'll get into, and other locations that will divert the attention away from that object that we can't get away from. Yes? That fake rock in the front yard. Yeah, that like <laughs> everybody knows is a fake rock. Yeah, I know. I yeah. Know. And that's, yeah. yeah. So to me, that fake rock is no different than just the well itself. Yeah. And I've had many clients ask, should I get one of the, nope, don't need it, because I'm either going to create a really large bed that incorporates it, or we can just dis just pretend it's not there. Essentially, um, it's more visible with the rock. Than uh, the rock. Right, because yeah. if I do a, if I do a large planting over here, yeah, it, well, it's just no different. Everybody knows a well is a well, or right? It's concrete. And now at this point, the only the only people who fooled, fooled anyone with the artificial rock were the first few people that had them, probably. <laughs> yeah, um, but now they sell them at the Home Depot, and, and everybody knows what they are, and they're all the same shape. Yeah. So, so that doesn't work. Okay, so views. Views must be considered, of course. And there's different types of views that you want to consider. So, of course, you're looking at views out your window. You want to take those in consideration. Um, and then even when you're in, in your yard or in the landscape, um, borrowed views. Okay, a lot of times we think about poor views. So poor views is on here. You know, maybe the, the next door neighbor has a junkyard or something and you need to do some screening. But um, oftentimes I also see, um, well, I see yards where there was a need for privacy, but at the same time, instead of, instead of stopping, say, say you have some evergreens for a need for privacy, Sometimes they need to stop. They don't necessarily need, just because you got a property line doesn't mean you got to line the whole thing. Because you may be cutting off a borrowed view, maybe you're, the neighbor's yard, or maybe they, the neighbor has a wooded lot, and if you stop that screen, then your yard looks like it's bigger. You know? So you have to think about, um, you know, 
there's a lot to consider. Um, also, the view of the house, of course. You want to stand back and look at the front of the house, look from other, other um, angles, um, even if it is the backyard. We're going to get into uh, balance and, and things like that, some design principles where you need to be able to stand back to assess um, what you need to do as far as the design goes. <clears throat> but definitely don't block your view um, of really beautiful, like even this, this, looking out this window, it almost looks like there's kind of a line here, um, so, and there's a little bit of a fence. So it looks like that's the end of this property, but look what's beyond a beautiful field. I would never want to put a screen across that. And, and shrink the, the size or the look of my own landscape. <clears throat> um, next, of course, you want to think about exposure, okay? Because when it comes to thinking about our plants, we need to know where, where's the sun and where's the shade. But not just where's the sun and the shade in general, uh, where is the sun and the shade in the winter versus the summer because the angle of the sun changes and therefore your shadows are longer in the winter. Those, those are things we need to, to take in consideration. Um, the soil, I, I'm sure you all have learned about that. It's great to, to do a soil test so you know what you're working with and what kind of amendments you need to add. And then the last one, which once again, if I were to rank these, I would actually put drainage up here first. Drainage is huge um, and it's often overlooked. Um, with landscape design, um, typically, I mean, it, it's just something that can't be ignored. It needs to be addressed, but it, but it often isn't. Um, you know, gutters, you've got gutters, well, where are they, where are they uh, dumping the water? Is it dumping in the bed? Does, does there need to be an extender on that gutter? Does it need to be, I love the pop-up emitters. Are you all familiar with these? So you can actually bury the pipe and a pop-up emitter is spring-loaded, okay? So when the, the pressure of the water um, builds up behind here, it pops up and the water spreads and is dispersed, so it's not concentrated, so it prevents erosion, and it stays flush with the turf area. So it's flush with the ground, so you can mow over it and everything. They're great. So I've, I've installed or uh, estimated to have a lot of those placed. Um, I also have a dry creek bed. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, a dry creek bed can be functional and yet absolutely beautiful, like that picture down in the, the, the corner. Um, so it's very important to know where your low spots are um, and also your, your slopes. That cannot be ignored because water has to go somewhere. <clears throat> okay, elevation. So these, all of these projects are not finished projects, but they're kind of in the in the works here. And there's some there's some mistakes. There's some things aren't that aren't the best case scenario. But sometimes in design, you're navigating um, within limits, okay, and you're just doing the best you can. <laughs> um, so with with elevation, you're thinking about retaining walls and terracing percent slope. It's good to look into percent slopes and what they one feel like. Um, what does an 8% slope feel like when you're walking up an 8% slope? For a patio, it's good to know that you really should not exceed a 2% slope. If you start to exceed the 2% slope, your, your nice drink is going to start sliding off your table. <laughs> you know? Um, and you'll feel it. So um, those are all things to consider. Step heights, what's comfortable. Typically in the landscape, I try not to exceed a 6 inch rise. Um, in inside, uh, I think inside the staircases, the I think it's like seven seven and a quarter inches or something is a typical stair inside. But outside, um, it's I try not to exceed that. But there is a really neat little uh, uh, formula here. If you go two times your rise, your inch and and your rise plus the inch the tread, whatever that is, it should equal around 24 to 26. Um, inches, uh, which gives a nice comfortable stem, okay? Um, that's just a little side note there. The other thing that you want to consider is space, okay? How, how is this space going to be used? If it's a patio, are we trying to put 
uh, you know, table and chairs, or just two tables and a chair, uh, a grill? What's happening out there? Um, how many people are you going to entertain uh, when it comes to, to cars? How many cars are going to be parked? You need to think about space and how much space do you need. Um, so, and then you got to work within those limits. So let me go into uh, some of these projects. This one, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a very steep driveway, okay? And the, the, the walkway prior to was very awkward, and the steps were, the whole thing, it was horrible. <laughs> um, and the homeowner was like, help me. So I did the best that I could to make it um, more functional and easy and, and also more aesthetically pleasing. And there's some things I don't like and things that change. This boulder went away after this boulder got me crazy. It didn't match, it didn't go. It, it, it. She liked the boulder, but I convinced her otherwise it didn't quite fit. Um, this scenario here, do you see that, how the step is a wedge? That is not ideal because it's a tripping hazard. Anytime that step up has a change in elevation, it can be a tripping hazard. There was absolutely no way around that because of, otherwise, if the it was so steep, which may not be so visible, that the side it was such a short turn that it would have been a very awkward as far as laying in that sidewalk. Um, that's the best I could do with that transition. Okay, so you gotta kind of know the rules, but then know when when you can break them or have to break them. Okay. Um, down here, there are a few things that happen. Um, one is this, do you see this step off from here? This big, that's how, when I went to this site, it was really, I mean, it's almost like a nine inch step. And, and if this was a young couple, it was their first home, and you know, that was gonna get old, it really quick. I, it's not good for your knees, it's not good for anybody. So, so, you know, my solution was to add, it was perfect to add a six inch step um, in there. Um, and then they also had, I don't know if you can see this, but this, their property was very short. It's a townhouse. Um, it actually, you can't, this is an optical illusion. It just dropped off. So we had factors. We had, we had a slope to contend with. We also had a budget. So budgets are real. And, and you have to work within them. So in order to really, if I was to give them a much larger patio space, I would have needed to, to put in a retaining wall and I was dealing with a, a tighter budget. So what I did, and they also wanted some raised bed. This wasn't complete because um, there was a raised bed that was going in here and the pathway was gonna come off. That's why that little nook is there. Um, the reason why I chose to put this picture in, even though it's incomplete and it looks horrible it looks like I did a bad job designing it. I didn't do that bad of a job. What happened was their parents wanted to buy them some patio furniture. And they bought patio furniture, and I had already told them, I even in the drawing, I showed them like the size, what they, they needed to be conservative. They couldn't, they couldn't afford to have bulky chairs. Well, they got bulky chairs. Um, so, so if you see, you see the leg of that chair, how tight that's, it, it really is, they needed different chairs and maybe even a different table. Um, they needed a very petite set and it would have been just fine. The other thing that you may not be able to see in the picture, when I went back to the site, they bought themselves a fire pit. They didn't tell me about the fire pit because the fire pit didn't exist. But they just got excited about using their backyard now they had a patio and they got a fire pit. Well, that would have changed the design completely. I probably would have solved problems a little differently. So you need to make sure you know all the, all the, the, the facts and all the, all the details, although they tricked me on that one. And then they put their grill in a location which is not where it was intended. Um, so, yeah, but as a designer, you just... Do what you can to guide people, and then they can do what they, they will. But you can see where, you know, your, the size of your space or the size of your furniture uh, matters, okay? Because that completely can change a space. Okay, the other thing to consider, of course, is the architecture, okay? What is the style of the architecture? That's going to influence the style of your landscape. They need to, to tie together. They need to relate to one another, okay? So um, as far as if you wanna accentuate vertical lines or horizontal lines, um, you can do that with the way you um, 
choose your plantings. Lines of extension or lines of force um, are really important with design. What I mean by that, and I almost probably should have drawn something, but I think I can use my words. Lines of, of extension are things like if you have a plan view of the home and you pull a straight line off of the corners, you pull a straight line off the center of the windows. Those, those lines are going to help dictate where things need to go. Okay, like we're going to talk about focal points in a little bit. So your focal, if you're going to look out the window, you may want to center a tree off the window. Okay, so, so all of these decisions are relating back to the architecture and they're not arbitrary because you, if you're pulling lines of extension, then it all is connected. It could be that it starts to dictate where your pathway goes, all right? Um, does that make sense? Okay, all right. Um, it can even be edges of windows or edges of doors or center of doors, and you can also make a hierarchy with that, like what, what's gonna be a stronger line of force, um, which is typically at corners and center of windows and things like that. The other thing to consider, of course, is the building materials and colors. Because we're going to talk about design elements such as color. Um, so you, you can, that, that may change if you've got a bright purple door, you may want to choose colors that are going to, maybe you want some yellows as a complementary color to the, to the purple. Um, so you, and then also materials. If you've got stone, like this home has stone on it, might be a good idea to introduce stone into the landscape and not necessarily brick because you know you don't want to incorporate too many different materials and you want everything to flow and to tie together okay so now we're getting into design principles um, you want to use your design principles because they create a sense of unity order and harmony in the landscape I think that's what we all want to feel when we're in a landscape is especially a residential landscape in commercial settings or you know you know um, say the National Mall or something there there are different feelings um, that a landscape architect is wanting to evoke or there's different um, uh, you know reasons for some of the decisions that are made um, with rhythm and things like that that we're going to get into in a little bit. But typically in a residential landscape design, I think we're all just looking to be at peace and in harmony, right? We don't want to look at a landscape and be stressed out, okay? Um, so we want to, with the design principles, we can also create visual interest. Um, and then when you incorporate the principles, you will have a beautiful landscape. Typically, <laughs> hopefully, right? So some of the principles that I'm going to go over today are balance, focalization, repetition and rhythm. They just kind of go together. Um, line and form composition and massing and simplicity. All right, so with balance, balance helps with creating a sense of order. Um, it creates the perception that various parts of the design are in equilibrium with each other. When it comes to balance, it's either going to be symmetrical or asymmetrical, okay? And I want to pause there for a minute and let's talk about that. I have many, many clients who tell me that they love symmetry and they need a symmetrical design. They must have some symmetry. And I say, that's great, but your house is asymmetrical. So how am I supposed to make these things, you know, marry together? So that's when I explain what balance is. And that typically when someone really loves symmetry, what they really love is balance. And once I explain that, they get it. Like, oh yeah, so it's balance. Because sometimes if you have a very asymmetrical house, if you put a symmetrical landscape in front of it, it's now going to be out of balance and it will not feel right. And speaking of feeling, that's the last part. When it comes to balance, it really is more, it's a feel 
Um, it's how you perceive it. You are looking at the landscape and you're thinking like, okay, I've got a big something over here and I'm doing an asymmetrical design, so how can I balance that even though I'm going to do some lower things, but I need maybe more of them. Um, so you're kind of thinking about that seesaw or the, um, what do you call it? Fulcrum or whatever. Uh, so, so you're thinking about that, but it really is a, it's a, a feeling. So it's kind of hard to teach it other than when we're talking about symmetry because that one's easy. Now even, I just pulled this image offline because you can see that this is a very symmetrical design, but even with this piece being symmetrical, notice how off on the sides, it wasn't possible to just stay symmetrical as you move away from the house because the house itself, do you see that? There's more house over here, so that's gonna have more weight. So it's a perceived weight, and so things, and then also you've got circulation issues. Who knows what the whole whole scenario was, but there's a lot to consider. Um, but they were able to maintain the symmetry just right here, and then as they moved away, the design starts to um, move away from symmetry in order to stay balanced. Um, this image is just um, a good example of uh, that, that perceived balance. So when you look at this image, would everyone agree that that's unbalanced? Right. <laughs> it's very heavy on this side, right? Yeah. And then this one, although some, some students of mine will still debate, it's not quite balanced enough. You would at least be able to agree that it's more balanced than this, than this image here, right? So this, this hardscape has a weight to it. There's a larger tree here, okay? And then a, across from here, are three smaller somethings. Um, so, and then, the, and then this is kind of a heavier mass, so things are a little bit more balanced, but still asymmetrical. Focalization. <clears throat> so, the use of focal points, which a focal point is an object that directly attracts an observer's attention can be things like sculpture and benches and bird baths and water features and specimen plants or an urn, a pot of, you know, there's many things. Um, and the other thing when it comes to plants is plants are fun because you can actually have a focal area or that, that shifts um, with the seasons. So maybe, you know, in the spring, there's this one area that kind of lights up and then, and then, in the, in the fall, there's some other area that becomes a focal area. Um, but ultimately, um, you are directing the attention and or taking advantage of a person's attention while moving through the landscape. So the way I, I said take, the reason why I said you take advantage of, of their attention, whenever you put somebody on a path, okay, whenever a design puts someone on a path, you're, the designer is in control of them as long as they're on that path, right? <laughs> so, so th these are opportunities. I try to, to you know, reiterate that with my students. Oftentimes, they have many it, when they're learning how to design. One of the things I'm noting on their designs often is missed focal point opportunity. Missed focal point opportunity because you've got someone on this path and then there's just nothing when it could be something. You know, it could be a focal, it could be a moment. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, you can also use it to draw the eye away from objects that you do not want to attract attention to, which is what we were talking about earlier with um, the well or, you know, some, some other object um, that you want to, to uh, redirect attention away from. Um, and then I put, be aware, be aware of their power. <laughs> Um, so, and, and that's what I meant, we basically kind of come full circle there. I think it's clear what I mean by the power of, of a focal point um, and how, uh, you know, you want to avoid bringing attention to things that you're trying to distract people from. So here are just some examples. This is what I'm talking about with like a seasonal bed where you see in the spring, it lights up, who knows what these are. This is just an image that I found. Um, but, you know, maybe once, because once the red twig dogwood leaves out, it's, you know, not something to draw your eye, but then maybe this is something that blooms in the summer, and, you know, that, so that area just keeps, keeps 
producing great focal points. Um, bird baths, uh, a bench, and then over here, I, for those of you who were in the, that three hour class I taught last year, um, this, this was a great image that generates a lot of conversation. Um, we get into a debate, and I'm open for that right now, does this little trellisy thing attract attention to the fire hydrant or draw the eye away? We get into a debate. Because maybe some people, you know, just focus on this and don't notice that, but um, more than likely it's kind of drawing your attention to it. But there may not have been, if they were trying to draw attention to the sign, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know what the situation is. I just think that picture is a really great example of how you really just need to think it through. Any thoughts or opinions on that? Well, they, they painted the fire hydrant to match so that if you notice it, uh, it's green. So On top. On top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. It's not red. All right. That's true. Okay, so repetition and rhythm. So repeating elements, uh, whether it be hardscape or your plants, uh, can really help with creating unity in your landscape. Um, by repeating the elements, this is gonna create continuity within the space and from one space to another. You can repeat form, color, texture. Repetition can come in, in many different ways. Um, and so repetition essentially does create rhythm. And I put staccato or legato. Staccato, for those of you who know a little about music, is when the notes are disconnected, right? They are. But think about a piano, and if you're if if something's legato, one note kind of bleeds into the other. They're they're connected. So I think of the landscape sometimes as I mean it's a composition, right? So when you're in when you're in the landscape, you can feel a rhythm when you have repetition. Let's take this for example, um, these Italian cypresses, if you're walking down the street, that's gonna create a rhythm. Every time you pass one, you're sensing that rhythm, right? And sometimes, and that's what I was kind of trying to refer to before with when you're not in a residential landscape setting, um, it, 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 that's necessary because you're trying to move people along. Let's go. The other thing that this is doing too, this is kind of separate, this is starting to create an, an implied wall, despite there being gaps. Um, this is a more contemporary design where they repeated the spheres. Uh, you know, some people like this, some people do not. It's hit or miss, there's no in between with that. It's a more contemporary design. Over here, this is an example of, to me, a more of a legato, more of things kind of flowing into uh, something else, yet, you see the repetition. You've got the grassy texture here. You've got the grassy texture here. You've got the grassy texture there. And that is also pulling the eye through the landscape when you have um, repetition like that. You're, you're kind of, you're, you're guiding someone um, with, with their eye through the landscape and drawing attention to what you, you want to draw attention to. Sometimes I do it with color. It could be like a chartreuse something uh, and then over here is another shirt because I'm trying to pull it towards the entryway. I'm trying to move that eye to go to wherever it is that I'm wanting someone to, to look. Um, does that make sense? Okay, now I want to mention this too in regards to the residential landscape because I do find, a, to me, what is a, a common mistake, especially in the front yard. And that is when someone plants one of these, one of those, 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 right? You see, you know, and it's just these little, and it's creating a rhythm, and that's great if that's what you're going for, but typically in a residential landscape, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for that harmony. We're looking for that ease to be able to look at the landscape and, our, and it just be, you know, our eyes can just move through very easily. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. have, have we all seen that? Mm -hmm. The one of these, one of those, where you're just kind of like, ooh, okay. Um, all right, line and form composition. So 
When it comes to what I mean by that is um, when you're designing, you're going to have your design composition. It's going to be these are a few of them: rectilinear, diagonal. You can use diagonals, angulars, arctangent, circular, or curvilinear, where a curve gives into a line. Um, and you want to be you want to be careful with how you use these. Um, you can switch from one to another, but you have to do it carefully uh, so that they don't fight each other. Okay, geometry is very strong, and when you're switching from one type of geometry to another, it takes a little finesse. And one way to just do it, an easy way to do it, is to look at your landscape as rooms. So just like in your home, if you one room may be designed in, in one way and then another room in a different way and there's a transition, like a doorway or something, there, there's a transition point. Um, you don't want to have multiple um, line or form compositions in a small space because it'll get very chaotic and you won't, it, it's hard to understand the space. Um, we're going to get that harmony, uh, that feeling of harmony and order when we can look at a landscape and understand it like that. Whenever there's a lot going on, it, that's when we're going to lose that harmony. Okay? So here's, here's a, just a, an example. This is a rectilinear design. And it's very simple, but it's very effective. And it's really relaxing to see because I can just look at this and I understand what's going on, right? But I see, see the lines, the lines, the steps, the lines, and then this is repeating. It's all, it's, it's just, it's simple. And you can see where it would be different if you started introducing other geometries in such a tiny space. It's very small. All right, so this this is um, kind of interesting. Um, so uh, there's more than one room here. Would you agree that maybe yes. this is the corner of one room, and then this is a room, and then there's a little room over here, right? So here's a rectilinear design, but then the way it's transitioning to a curvilinear, it, it works, I think, um, the way that it, it ties, ties in there. <clears throat> And then just to give examples of what, what I mean by rectilinear, this is when you're, you're going to have your 90 degree angles, um, arc and radius, arc and tangent. Um, this is biomorphic or more organic. This one, what bothers me about this is, you see this sliding door yeah. here? I want to pull lines of force off of here and I want to move that tree. If that tree was, it was if it's existing, that's one thing, we can't move it. But if it was proposed, why not make it more of a focal instead of some random arbitrary location? Um, this is rectilinear once again. What's fun though to me, I like that they dropped in a few circles. That's, that's okay, it actually makes it more interesting, right? Um, this is a, a design of uh, almost completed work that I, I have a lot of uncompleted photos. <laughs> I need to work on, on that. Um, but, you know, there's a circular pattern here, and so I designed the bench so that it too was circular. Could I have gone straight across? Sure. But it flows a little bit better, and then the, the little um, pergola there behind it, uh, it, it arcs as well. <clears throat> Okay, so massing slash simplicity. So massing, um, they're kind of two, two different things because you can get simplicity not necessarily with, with massing, but I just put them together for, for this presentation because I do think that, that massing can, can help with, with making sure you have simplicity in your landscape, um, which is going to also help with creating order, okay? Um, when things are very scattered and unconnected, it creates a chaotic, busy feeling in the design, which is not what we're going for in a residential uh, landscape. Um, and also, there's minimal impact. Minimal impact uh, in that you really can't, you don't even have a moment. If you've got one of these, one of those, one of these, you know, it's just like a little bit of everything. A lot of times you can't really appreciate what all's in the landscape. 
You can get away with it, so you got to know the rules, know when to break them. You can get away with one of these, one of those, one of these, one of the, a little variety in a smaller space. In a small space, you can because you can appreciate all the textures and the colors and the differences. When we're looking at a big scale, big picture, you need to make sure you have some massings that are tying it all together. Okay. Um, can I ask yeah. you? Yes. Is is an English garden massing? And then that's legato. Okay. Yes. So uh, an English garden has a couple things that they that are going on. English gardens, a lot of times, you're going to have lots of massings of perennials. You may even have perennials that are, you know, not necessarily even sweeps of of big masses. I mean, ideally, that would be nice. But if there is a lot of variety, the way that an English garden works is that a lot of times they have boxwoods. Okay, a line of a hedge. Have you ever noticed that? So you've got the hedge and then behind that. So it's order and chaos together. When order is placed, you can have the chaos all you want. Those, those plants can be back there dancing, they can be all kinds of different colors, it's a party back there. But you've got, you've got, the, you've got the, the hedge that is containing, containing it all and allowing there to be order so it all makes sense. If you have just the, the perennials with no order or structure, in a perennial border, often you want to at least have some evergreen structure in there too, which can also help with adding that order. But having a nice hedge, that's a typical English garden. Does that make sense? And, and you know what I'm talking about, you probably envision it. Um, so, so there is, um, and there's massing, a lot of times it's, uh, well, I mean, there could be lots of different types of, of perennials, but there's still organization even with the perennials as far as heights, because you want to think about that, right? You're layering up if you have, say, a wall, and then you've got your perennials and then your, your hedge of some sort. Um, you're going to have the taller things in the back. There's got to be some kind of order even to the chaos, right? Okay. Um, when things lack massing, this is just some digital image that I just think is great because it really shows what I'm talking about. With there's parts of it where the design is starting to come together, but then it just falls apart. And like this little island, I mean, this, this is just a lot going on. Um, with just one, it's just this, it just looks like a bunch of plants were thrown up in the air, and where they land is where they were planted. Um, I don't really, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to it, um, so we want to avoid that. Um, so, and then here's just some images that, you know, where you, you, if you have that, that sweep, so you have a, a sweep of the hoopera and then a sweep of the hydrangea, um, and then you've got the texture of, here's just some structure here, which is nice. Now, I realize that in this image, um, you know, there may be times of the year where it's not as interesting, but still having the big, the long sweeps. You look at that, your eye just, just it just flows. It's not interrupted, and it's just that is to me that's harmony, right? It's just peaceful. Um, I can just relax and take in the view. I don't have to try to make sense of it. All right, so design elements. <clears throat> design elements are things such as form. So when we're looking at our trees, trees have different forms. Columnar, oval, vase-shaped, weeping, pyramidal, round. Um, and then we also have the, the shrub shapes, which are somewhat similar. Um, and then we've got color, okay? Color is, is a big one um, that we want to consider. We need to understand color to be able to utilize it. So for those of you who may not know, this. This is the color wheel, and on the color wheel, we have warm colors and cool colors. And that's important to know uh, when it comes to how they make you feel, okay? So the warm colors tend to be more excitable, very warm. Um, they're also easier to see far away. So if you have a deep yard, backyard, or landscape, you may want to put some of your brighter colored plants in the, in the back. When it comes to the cool colors, they're going to be appreciated more easily 
close to you and in smaller settings. And they do, as you can tell, they have a very relaxed, calming feel. Okay? I mean, it's the same with paint colors. <clears throat> okay, complementary colors. Complementary colors are good to know. They are op opposite on the color wheel. They truly do complement each other. Um, when blue and orange are together, uh, they're complementing each other. One is no more dominant than the other. Um, complementary colors are used uh, everywhere in graphic design. Um, they just, they, they, they make things pop, okay? Um, I did have a student recently who said, I hate complementary colors. And that's okay. So in her yard, she's up, but it's good to still understand how they work. I think I didn't really get to the bottom of why she hates them. It's a very strong word. Um, I think it might be because they are, it, it, is, it has a very high impact. So, you know, it's not going to be relaxing to see complimentary. That's exciting. So it may, it's going to draw your attention. It might be something fun to do at the front entryway if you're trying to draw the entrance to your front door. Yes? Where's white in all of this? It's coming up. Um, white is, is, that helps with your tints, but I, I'm going to come up on white. Well, it may be in the end, but, um, okay. So these are some good examples of the use of complementary colors. You can see it's very exciting, I think. Um, but it definitely has a different feel because it's not the same as all warm colors or all cool colors, um, but it definitely has that pop. Then you also have analogous colors. These are colors that are side by side on the color wheel and they tend to really um, go well together. So that's something to, to consider. Here are some examples. So you can see the reds and the oranges and maybe even a little bit of yellowish in there. Um, those are analogous. And then over here we've got our pinks and purples, um, how they just kind of flow together. Um, so the monochromatic, this is, so white, white can go with any of those other colors. Um, but one way that I think white has high impact, it's a great color to do a mono, like a white garden. Uh, to do a more monochromatic. This is very dark too for some reason. I guess I need to fix this. But um, so, so this is all white. These are white. It's just kind of a very, and so it's just white and green. And it's just very kind of classic clean look. Um, and this, this is more of your, um, I know this is kind of like a bluish hues and greens that are in here. But, it, and then the cool thing, and this is all, all purples, but what's neat about, to me, what's exciting about doing monochromatic, some people may look at monochromatic and say, why would you do that? Well, you do that because you change the story from color to texture. Because when it's all the same color, you really can start to appreciate all the different textures. Um, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, the one that was right before this, what did you call it? And what, and I, you know. Analogous. Analogous. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so here's another example. So textures next. And this is a great example. This leads right into what I was saying before about the monochromatic. This is a great example. Here's a black and white photo. We don't have any we don't have any color here, but look at all that different texture. Right? Um, so you've got coarse texture, medium texture fine texture, and those textures, like this is a hosta, right, and it's coarse in this landscape, but maybe if, if it was with uh, anything that had a larger leaf, then it no longer is the coarse texture. So it changes, everything is, it's all relative to what's around it, how, that's how texture works. Um, and then here's the texture plus some color. And this is a great example of it's not actually breaking the rules, but it's a great example of it in a very small space. So say you have a bench over here where you're looking at this and you can appreciate, so you have one of these, one of those, you're, you do lack a little bit of massing, but it's okay in a, in a tiny micro uh, space. Does that make sense? Okay. You just want to be careful that on a large scale, if you had that going on and you multiplied it, it would not be very peaceful or enjoyable. Uh, yeah, that's that's, <laughs> that's had a high impact with the texture. Just along. And this one's funny too because some people think it's so cool and other people are like, oh, I hate that. But I guess maybe if the light grasses 
to enjoy it. I'm not sure. I just found the, the <laughs> um, So, and then the other thing to, to think about, I, I like to throw this one in here, um, just because when it comes to texture, this is actually a texture. It, it, that becomes your coarse texture in this whole picture. Um, and speaking of picture, think about when you're looking at a garden space or a landscape, you may even want to do one of these. And really think about the picture. It may help kind of make you focus and, and really understand what's happening here as far as all of the, these design elements go. Okay, so once all these things are considered, which is first, function, doing your site analysis. Second is form, and that's your design principles and your design elements. Once all of those things have been considered, you can add a little whimsy, okay? So whimsy can be, it's fun, right? But whimsy works when you have all of those things first, and then you know where you can add it. If you have whimsy without all that, it, it doesn't go, it doesn't work very well. It too will fall apart and it won't look cute or whimsical. It will just, it, it, it will not be very artistic. Um, uh, it'll just look junky. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but whimsy is, I'm, I'm all about it if it's done, um, if you still have principles at play. Uh, then you can have those little fun moments if that's your style. Okay, and then as far as when it comes to creating a landscape and achieving all of these things, for me, I like to I use my pen and paper for organization. You may <coughs> also, okay. But some of the best gardens that I've ever really experienced that were in a residential setting were ones that were not put on paper. And this is, this is one of my favorite little spots here. This is actually my mom's little garden area. They had a, a landscape designer uh, design their property many, many years ago, which is how I was exposed to landscape design at the age of like nine. Um, and, and she did a great job of organizing the land and, and getting some massings in there. But this one little spot off of there, so here's their carport, this one little patch over here um, my mom did her own thing and has done for years and I have many pictures of this it's evolved over time but you can see where just innately she she kind of knows design <laughs> principles whether she knows it or not um, she has no clue that this is up here right now um, but you can see see that massing and how it skips the walk and then it continues of the Rebecca here. And then in, a, in the early spring, this is all irises, and then she has it sewn like over here. Like, so she does the whole, she has massings, but then also little pops of whatever that is repeated. Um, so I call that also, I have little goofy terms here that I picked up over the years, some from other designers. Um, one thing that I teach my students is, um, remember the one that got away. And that is, if you have a group of, one thing that really works in design, if you're doing an asymmetrical plan, you may have a grouping of say three or five or whatever, and then if you do another little grouping, it could be one or it could be a few other somewhere else, but not too far away or you lose the connection. It's, re it's repetition and it, and it um, really connects things, all right? So, and then this is just this little, so she has some, some focal points and whatnot, and I like how her hierarchy of her pathways, I've, I chose the wrong picture, but um, she has, has a potty shed over here that's really cute, and so this pathway, goes, she goes out there often, so this is a more uh, secondary pathway for her primary almost, um, and then there's a, a little path that goes over to where the, the water hydrant is, and then there's this other path that you can see lines up with, with this here. So this is kind of looking from the fire pit across there. So things are really connected. Um, but, you know, if you just, if you know your principles and you're, if you use your design principles and you put in a little love in the garden, you're gonna have a beautiful, a beautiful space. They're some of the best, the best ones I've ever experienced. I actually had another set of pictures. I was in Beaufort recently and um, I, I was walking down the street admiring this garden and the lady came out and invited me in 
not knowing I was a landscape designer, was showing me around. And I took some pictures of it, um, and it was a neat garden that she never had a design for. She designed, she designs like a mother, which is just kind of shoot from the hip and what feels right, you know. Um, and and it was just so much fun. A landscape you can feel when someone really loves it, and and you know. There may have been in that garden maybe too many focals that were fighting, but that's okay because she loved it and, and it was it was fun. Um, and that's important too, I think. So that's all I have for today. Any questions? Trying to put together pipes. Um, evergreen, tree, uh, all that type of thing. And okay. Just all right. That's a, that is a good question. Okay. So she's asking, how do you put together um, basically a planting plan with considering heights and all the things that you've got to consider? I mean, I know we only have an hour. That's a lot to pack in. But here's just a, 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 a little nutshell or a, a piece of advice. Typically, what you want to do is you start with the trees. Figure out where you want the trees to go. If you want a tree to be a focal, if you need the tree for balance, figure out where the tree goes, then start thinking about your shrubs, then start thinking about your perennials, and maybe your grasses are mixed in there too, um, then, then your ground covers. So you want to, so basically think of trees and your evergreens as the bones of your garden, right? So there are the bones, and then you're adding the, I'm, I'm kind of making this up right now, <laughs> it's an analogy, but, but you've got your bones, your structures, then you've got your muscles, the, the, um, the, which would be your shrubs, okay, kind of the, the meat of things. Um, and then you're going to be going more into little details. I would say, so now I'm going to switch my analogy, when it comes to annuals and things like that, annuals to me are the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So I have to change my analogy now to go back to the, <laughs> the trees, I guess being the cake, I don't know. I've got to work on my analogy. <laughs> um, but, but definitely start with that, that will help you with figuring out how to structure with a planting plan. Would you have a book to recommend or a book? Um, uh, I have so many books, and I'm not what I so many books. Um, so I don't have one off the top of my head. If I if I think of some, I can email Mark and and uh, maybe yeah, I go look through my collection. There's so many books. I have a lot of books. <laughs> so as far as plant, because because really there's, it's hard to have just one book mm -hmm. that is the book. No, but I mean, for me to go into the library, it's like, yeah, it, it, you could help me as far as... Well, what is it that you're wanting help with, too? Is it the design piece? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, we've got the books, the book that we use, um, uh, design. It's bad that I don't know the, the title of it. Uh, it's on the syllabus. So <laughs> I should have that memorized. I'll get that to them as well. Okay. Um, but it, it does kind of break things down um, nicely, I think. Because, um, I mean, we use that in a workbook, but, um, yeah, I'll just email Mark. Yes? Just a comment. I think, for me, the before and after are really helpful. Yeah. Like, what it was and what you did with it. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's really, you know, that allows me to be more creative in my thinking. Yeah. So I wish I had more. I've, I've yeah. done such a poor job of taking pictures yeah. before. And yeah, after it, it looks so, such a mess, you probably don't feel like taking a picture of it. But, but yeah. that's, that's what really Yeah. Or after, really as far as going back to the landscapes, I would love to go and have the images, you know, three years after something was installed. Right, right. Of course, right. hoping that it was maintained properly, because that changes things. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. But it's a landscape, it's not perfect. It's not it's perfect. Grown. It's ever it's evolving, and that's, yeah. that's one thing. I know you all know that, but I, I'm constantly having to. Um, explain that to customers that it's not, you know, because 10 years down the road after they've had a landscape, they're like, hey, well, it's overgrown. Absolutely, it's overgrown. It's, not it's going to be overgrown. It's not and possible. I, it's not possible because, so I have to explain on the front end, though, you know, this plan is more of like a, a five year plan. It'll probably maybe look more, it's best in three years, but five years, once we start getting past five years, we may need to have, some things may need to go, may not be room. 
Um, in 10 years, it will be evergreen. But if we put in a 10-year plan, you're going to hate it for many, many years before it looks good. So, so that's why we have to design for, um, you know, because I know I hear that a lot that people complain, oh, the designer uh, put too many plants in. And maybe sometimes they, they do, but, but it also could be somebody not understanding what you're working with something that's moving and fluid and you're just picking a point to say it's going to look its best in five years. A lot of times I'll ask customers too how long, when I, work, when I worked in Northern Virginia, I worked with a lot of military families. And they were, they, I would be like, you know, how, how long do you plan to, to have this home? Well, we're going, to be, we're going to be selling in two years. So I might actually make it, you know, take that in consideration and make sure that it's going to be looking its best in two years. So the next homeowner I mean, not exactly. Maybe not like who designed this, but it's you know trying to work with time. So.